Thank you so much, Tony, for being my guest. I'm truly honored. How are you today? Catherine, thank you for having me on your show. I can't wait to hopefully give some value to your audience and give them some takeaways so they can take some action after this. I am absolutely sure you will. I read your story on your website, but I would like you to tell us a little bit about it. My story, you know, I've been asked that story. Let me see if I could do a different version of the story. Let me think here. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that for me, I grew up not really having a whole lot of fancy things, but I was surrounded by other kids who did have a bunch of fancy things. And I never really resented them. I never felt envious, but I always asked myself, how do I get that? And I was always a kid that would see my parents uh, and, and I would see how hard they were working. My mom worked in public schools as a cafeteria worker. My dad, he was a Vietnam vet, he's a US Marine. And then he went into chemical refineries after he got out of the military when I was, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But you know, they worked really hard and, and put in a lot of hours and sometimes we, they were unemployed and we lived in flip houses and we just tried to be in a town that had a good school system for my sister and I, even though that we, we probably couldn't afford to really live there like the rest of the community. It was a very upper middle class affluent community and we lived in the, the crappiest houses in the whole you know, neighborhood. But the thing is that I was always curious as a kid. And I knew that I didn't have money and I knew that my parents weren't going to give me any money. So they were always encouraged me to figure out how to make money. And that meant I was pushing the lawnmower and knocking on doors and trying to sell toys and walking dogs and washing cars and raking leaves and anything I could to make a few bucks so I could have video games and skateboards and, and things like this. So, you know, we, we call that kid printer nowadays, but to me, that was, I was either going to have nothing or I was going to go figure out how to make something. And my, I remember going to some of my friend's parents' house, you know, and they would you know, have really nice homes and nice cars. And I, I would always ask how they made it. You know, how do you, how do you make, how do you make money? How do you, you know, how do you afford a house or a car like this? And, and I think that the, the parents actually knew that I was being genuine and not being like a hater, you know, things like that. I was actually legitimately asking. So they'd always give me answers. Well, you know, you need to go to college and you need to get a degree and you need to do one of these three things. It was a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer and, <laughs> you know, and, and, or be a business owner. It was always like the successful people always had like the same careers. And I started to see that trend and I said, okay, so, you know, I used to think that if you made $100,000, you were rich, right? You're going to be rich if you make $100,000, mostly because here in the United States, that $100,000 a year salary has always been the dream since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And in, maybe in the 1960s, $100,000 was a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is that inflation has outrun reality and the dream is not as big as it should be. I mean... Nowadays, people should be saying, hey, I want to make 500000 a year to be rich, to feel rich, right? But we don't say that. We still say chasing six figures. And, you know, unfortunately, so many people get there and they, they think they're going to have everything made. And they're, and they're kind of like, this isn't as good as I thought it would be. What's going on with this, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was my, my pursuit of six figures was going to engineering school and paying for that myself and working construction just like my dad. And then when I finally got out of college, I was sitting around, I was 27. It took me seven years. I was working full time. I was being a waiter and, and being a mechanic and going to school at nighttime and not getting enough sleep and struggling with relationships and grades and feeling stressed and broke. And, and when, I, when I finally got an engineering job, I was 27 and I was getting home at 430 in the afternoon. And I felt like it was a part time job. I was like, I had a 40 hour work week, but it felt like a part time job. And I was like, I would ask real hard questions myself, am I where I want to be? Is this, I think I was making 40,000 at the time, entry level salary. Mm -hmm. I said, is this really where I want to be? I mean, yeah, I got a newer car, I have an apartment, but I, I'm not where I want to be. So I, I actually put my apron on and I went back to waiting tables while I was at an engineering career. So I, I had evenings off. I said, like, you know, I could go make an extra $150 a night. And that's what I did. I went back to the restaurant that I was a manager and a waiter at. And my friend was a, still a manager there. So he let me pick up shifts and I went seven nights a week. And I did that for a couple of years. And first company I started, I was age 28. You know, I was, I had a, I had a newborn son and I just needed to start something. And uh, yeah, things kind of took off. I didn't even know this part of the story. 
but we have so much in common because I come from the similar family and I used to work in my dad's fast food restaurant while I was in college, making my own way to become a programmer and then finally realizing that's not the way I want to live and starting my own business. So yeah, we, we have a lot of in common and, and I truly, truly resonate with your story. I love something that you said on your website that you observed people who were on hierarchy level uh, higher than you and you ask yourself is this the life I want to live and obviously the answer was no so you you gave it a shot you started your own business at 28 right and in two years you were earning more than than your salary and very very soon you became a multimillionaire. that's such an awesome story and knowing now the background you came from I'm not surprised at all because you know uh, people like that people like us, if I may say so, we have that urge to, to do things, to change things, to make things work, to make something work out of our lives. And, and obviously, and obviously you got the results. Um, tell us a little bit about the Side Hustle Millionaire, your book, which you, which you wrote and, and <laughs> which made you famous, actually. Well, it all goes back to the book came out in May of 2018. So we're going into year three right now. <clears throat> But the idea for my book probably started showing up in my head around 2012, 2013, somewhere around there, about five years before I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a, a thought because everybody kept asking me for advice, right, for business. Hey, Tony, how do you start a business? How do you become successful? And, and here's the thing is that you know, I built that company in 2001 and I sold it for millions in 2007. And then I started some other businesses and those did really well as well. And my friends and my people that I worked with, because here's the funny thing about it. Like you said, I, I always had a job. I never went full time in entrepreneurship. So even though I had a company making me 400,000 a year and, and I had, you know, made millions from selling it, I never quit my job. And, and it was funny because I, I had to really understand why later on. Mm -hmm. And it's because of my parents. You know, it's because of my parents, I didn't quit that job. And, and also it was because I, I struggled to pay for that degree myself and I didn't want to waste my education because you, know, you hear that like, oh, you, you're just wasting your education. I mean, everybody says that nowadays. I mean, the reality is that only, only 30% of people with a degree are actually working in the profession that their degree plan is actually in. Did you realize that? Like 70% of people with a degree are not even using their degree. So are they wasting it? I don't know. I mean, are they, did they learn something from it that applies to their current career? Possibly. Yeah, maybe so. Probably a good odds at that. But for me, I always heard my mom and her voice specifically, even after I sold a company and made millions of dollars, she just still asked me if I was looking for a job. You know, she just, Mine too. <laughs> just are, you, are you looking for a job? Are you going to use your engineering degree? I'm like, no, mom, I'm, I'm doing all right, mom. And until I start asking you for money, like, you know, don't give me any advice on, on business or careers. But it's really like your mom and my mom, they, they grew up in a different era and not having a job was the scariest thing in, in life yes. and you know, not, not being able to feed your kids or have a roof over your head is like terrifying to, to our parents. And uh, largely a lot of people in our generations still feel that way because that's how they're raised. Mm -hmm. But we've also unfortunately had this dependency on having a boss or a company to pay for that. We need to have a job. We have to have steady job. We have to look for the better paying job. It's always, here's what we need and here's the solution. It's a job. And going through public schools, that's all we learn. Mm -hmm. We don't learn about, hey, you know what? You could actually start a business and be the boss. We don't learn that mm -hmm. because we're told silly things like it, it takes money to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to become a millionaire before you can build a million dollar company. Like, you just hear these things from people who don't have money. Mm -hmm. And you think that's the truth because you love those people and you trust them and your teachers and your parents and your uncles and you love these people. So you have no reason to, to think they're lying because they're not lying. They just don't know the answer. Exactly. So they, they tell you things to keep you safe. Oh, that sounds really risky. Uh, I think I'd rather just have a steady job. Are you sure you want to waste that money? I mean, Oh, wow. That's your life savings. You're going to put in that job. Uh, you sure you want to take that chance? They, they tell you stuff like this because they don't understand what it's like to be on the other side and win and actually do the things that you dream about. So honestly, 
I didn't expect myself to be an entrepreneur or multimillionaire, all these things, these titles that we were. I didn't know what that was. And I just wanted a creative outlet from my career because I wasn't getting what I wanted. Uh, I wanted more responsibility, more challenge. And I got tired of being told, wait your turn, you're too young and all these things. So I said, okay, I'll go create a business and get this on the external. So that's what I did. So the book, I came across a lot of people I was working with and they'd see the fancy lifestyle that I would have outside of work. And they're like, you know, or were you born rich or, you know, what's going on? Did they, or or sometimes I had bosses that would say, we must be paying you too much. Your car is nicer than mine. And and, and honestly, I'd be like, no, this is actually a full-time career, but it's actually a part-time income. I tell them that (laughs) it was was the truth. And, and, And it was, it was so funny because People would always ask me for advice, but very few people would actually take the advice and do something with it. You know, and that kind of frustrated me because I took it personal. I was like, what are they not doing? I'd see these same people three years down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, and I'm doing a lot better every time they see me, but they're in the same situation. They're still complaining about their job. Sometimes they're still working in the same company mm-hmm. and, and they're like, oh man, it looks like you're doing so well. And you know, how are things going? And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing their health fade and their finances fade. And I'm thinking, man, I give you all this advice for years and you never did anything with it. And I, I feel bad. Like, is it me or, you know, what's going on? So fast forward 2015, I was in a, a car accident. I raced cars, right? I love cars. Mm-hmm. And I, and I crashed a car at the track. I hit a concrete wall at 130 miles per hour. Wow. And as I was approaching that wall, I thought I was going to die in that moment. And I even said to myself, well, here I go. And the weirdest thing about that, Catherine, is that I felt an overwhelming sense of peacefulness in that moment. You think you would be scared or, you know, freaked out, but my steering wheel was straight and the car was going left and I was going towards the wall and I was like, well, here I go. And, and, and it felt like an eternity. It was only a few milliseconds, but it felt like a really long time. And I, I survived the accident without any major accident, major injury. I had all my safety gear on, but I, I for a moment, I really thought I was going to die. And, the car was destroyed. I mean, there was wheels off the car. Every panel was crushed in except for where I was sitting. So it was kind of a miracle that I didn't get injured at all. Mm-hmm. And that made me go through a lot of soul searching in you know, 2015. And I said, okay, I think I was 43 or 42 at the time. And I said, do I really want to work this career the rest of my life? And, and the first question that comes to my mind is why am I still here? And the next question I said, what if I would have died? And then the next question I I think about was how would I have been remembered? Right. And then I was like, well, did I do enough? Did I create enough impact is that's the the final question. And I said, okay, I've done this, 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 and this. And I was like, okay, so I've impacted my family and and close friends. That's about it. But is that enough? Is is that my potential? And the answer is no. The answer was that was not even close to my potential because I knew and I've had this book in my mind for a few years. I, I know all the stuff. I have experience. I have the willingness to teach it. But what I was afraid, I was afraid of being in front of cameras. I didn't like being on recorded voice. I didn't like being on stage. I I, I, I just avoided that. It, I was really uncomfortable with it. And anytime people would ask me, hey, you should write a book or you should do this. I would say, oh, yeah, I'm busy. I've got a job. I've got a kid, a career. And I would make up a bunch of excuses just because I didn't want to do kind of like what we're doing right now. We're talking and camera and you see me stand on stages and I've been on TV and radio and all this stuff. And I had no interest in doing that because I was scared of critics and and, and being bullied and, and negative people. And that's I have a very comfortable life. I don't have to do that. But after that accident, something, something shifted. And I realized that time, time is not guaranteed and that, I need to go do something different with, I need to create real impact because I've always been someone that's a high achiever and pushed myself to do things, but it was a, it was a blinking neon light in my life that I was not doing nearly what I could be doing. And so the book was the first idea is like, okay, I'm going to write this book. But here's the funny thing, Catherine, that book you mentioned, Side Hustle Millionaire. Even when I was writing it, I was, I was thinking that this would be the great way for to get the knowledge in my mind out to thousands of people I used to say, Mm -hmm. but it, but it's a, a book is actually a cowardly way of putting your knowledge out there because if you don't want to, you still don't have to be on cameras. You still don't have to stand on stages. You still don't have to be interviewed if you don't want to, you and I, we could, 
We could be walking down the sidewalk and a New York Times bestseller could walk past us and we probably wouldn't recognize them unless they were a celebrity, mm -hmm. right? So a book is actually a really a, a way of getting your message out there, but it's still kind of a cowardly method of doing so. Because again, you could still hide. Nobody has to know you, right? They may recognize your name, but they may not think it's the same person if your face is not on the cover. So even then, you know, and <laughs> I credit my, my book editor for making me really changed my perspective. I knew that I needed to be a different person. I knew that I needed to, to get over that fear and I'm giving him chapter at a time as I, I'm completing. He's like, man, this is really good. I think that it's going to sell a lot of copies. This is a good book. And they're going to want to interview you and they're, they, you might be on TV and radio and podcasts. And I was like, Oh crap. It's like you, crap. And so he kept saying it to me and, probably by like chapter four of chapter five, I'm like, you know what? I need to, I need to overcome this fear. I need to become the right person, not only to write the book, but to speak the book and to carry that message. If I really want to make impact, because I started thinking back at that accident, am I doing enough? And if I'm hiding from potential critics, that's not doing enough because my purpose had become stronger than my fear in that moment. And I decided I joined Toastmasters and I, and I made myself really uncomfortable and I went every week and I raised my hand and I you know, participated and I learned public speaking and then I would do videos on Facebook and Instagram to learn, practice what I was learning. And they were pretty awful videos and I was scared to even make videos. But I, I knew that I had to do that in order to improve and that's what I did. I just went all in. I, I didn't worry about whatever people were saying and it really changed my life. Like I'm not the same person I was that started in 2017. So even a two year period, I left my corporate career in 2015 after the wreck, never wanted to go back. And I took two years of figuring out what I wanted to do. And then 2017, I started to do what I'm doing now. So crazy. I'm just speechless and I'm speechless for, for so many reasons, because your story match my story in so many ways um this podcast is not about me but i wish to share a piece of it absolutely i'd love to hear about it i survived bombing in ex yugoslavia and i uh, was in an underground shelter when one of the detonations the, the the most powerful one hit like maybe two kilometers away from that shelter mm. but i felt it's done and my dad was in military. They, they took him away. I was alone with my mom, my brother, and my grandma in that, in that basement. And the same questions you ask yourself after the accident were the questions that I asked myself. And I went on a spiritual journey and, and opening myself. And I didn't want to come on, on, on videos. I didn't want to come on interviews. I didn't even want to start my own podcast, believe me. Oh. But I published my book in 2017, which became a bestseller. Yeah. And I, I've got a lot of media attention. I had no idea what to do. Not just that I hide, Tony, but I hide behind the pen name because Catherine Leroy is my pen name. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, you understand exactly what I'm I understand going. Yeah, exactly I what you're talking about. I but I made it through. I was an engineer. I started this in 2015, in February. In 2017, it became Same years. Same years. <laughs> and, and here we are. And yeah. now it's okay. I mean, now I'm like on stages and speaking and talking to people and interviewing people and all is well. But still, you know, I'm an introvert. I like doing things behind the scenes. But yeah. you know, in this, this kind of job, you have to be in front of the scene. Of course, I, I still don't have results as you have, but I hope I will one day. Uh, you will. You just will. Just say you will have those results. You will. <laughs> Thank you. No, just nobody I'm will see your dream as good as you will. You, you know, nobody will see your dream. They'll question you all along the way. I feel like I'm building a legacy, uh, especially since I became mom, and it's it's a deeper purpose. Um, yeah, so I'm very very touched with your story, and I and I feel it deeply. I understand every word. That's why I was smiling all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't even have to ask you what is the prerequisite for business success because you you said it all. It's actually from inside out and how we actually approach to do things. But tell us a little bit about 365 driven. And what do you offer to the world now? So 
somewhere in that 2016, 2017 timeframe, I started to really evaluate and assess what my unique strengths and what we call superpowers, right? What are your superpowers? <laughs> I was like, man, I don't know what my superpower was. I wasn't a very good speaker at the time. I had to, I really had to train to just do what I'm doing nowadays, like a lot, thousands of videos. And, but I've always been a leader. I was always the leader of my friend circles. Even as a kid, I was, I was the leader. I was the one I was going to take change. And I got that from my dad. I mean, he's a, he was always a leader in his, his career as well. And I said, okay, I've been a leader and I built a company that the first business was an online community for performance cars. And that one grew to 300,000 registered members. And then I said, Hey, this works pretty well. I'm a leader of this. And I took the same business model and I duplicated it. And I made another community for truck people that like to race and modify trucks. And that one grew to over 200,000 registered members. So I'm very good at building large communities. I understand the dynamics and the leadership required to do those. And so, so what are the other things I love? And when I started thinking about how am I going to impact the world? Well, yeah, you can be in philanthropy and build a nonprofit. You can, and, and I'm a, I sit on the board of a couple of those, but that's like, that's not what my true impact was. My true impact was I've only loved really two things. And even as a kid is cars and, and entrepreneurship. And, you know, I would go to the grocery store when I was a kid with my mom and I would run to the magazine rack back when those were really big, you know, and, she would go shopping and I would read magazines. I would read my car magazines and I would read Entrepreneur and I read Forbes because they were always talking about money on the cover of those and I didn't have any money. So I figured if I read these, maybe I'll figure out how to make money. And that, and, I, and I actually would get a subscription of these things and I would read them and I didn't know what I was reading, but I would just try to read them and try to understand. And I was like 13, 14 years old doing that. And eventually probably by like 15, 16, I actually could read those and understand what was being said. And which is really young for that kind of a knowledge base. And, uh, you know, I learned really from magazines and, and so, okay. So I said, well, here's the skills I have. I like building massive communities and I like to have some subjects that I'm passionate about and I want to create impact. So I figured out that my greatest impact to this world will be teaching people confidence and business principles that led to success. Cause I'd like to, show people how the freedom exists to be an entrepreneur and actually make your own money and not have to rely on having someone to tell you what to do or tell you what time you need to be there and all these different things. Like there's so much freedom on the other side of that people don't even understand. And we can say these things, but they'll never understand it until they experience it. I was sitting at dinner last night with a brother-in-law. He started a business of his own after going through job after job after job. He, he finally started a business painting and restoring kitchen cabinets and for the first time, he was, he's, he's been doing it a couple of years now. His business is really doing well now. He's, he's starting to make good money. And he's like, man, I just never knew it was like this. He's always watched you, Tony, like doing things. And, you know, you guys always had freedom. You could go on vacation wherever you want, whenever you want, hang out with whatever you want, buy whatever you want. And he's like, I never understood. I, I see you doing it. But he goes, you know, him and his wife or, but now that we're experienced it for the last two years, like we would never go work for anybody else ever ever again. Like even the, I would make less money and, and still do what I'm doing and be happy because the, the happiness you get from freedom is unexplainable. Like no amount of telling you is going to, to make you realize it until you've truly experienced it. Because my first job was McDonald's at age 15. So I always had a job and from age 15 to age, I guess, 42 or something, you know, I always had a job. So I didn't experience that. And so now it's like, I try to open people's eyes and 365 driven as an entrepreneur society. It's a, it's a, it's a community of entrepreneurs. Cause that's what I like to build is communities. So I wanted to build a place for mentorship, support, guidance, accountability, knowledge, mentors, all these things that entrepreneurs need things. I wish I would have had 20 years ago when I was getting started. And, you know, nowadays it's about 4,000 entrepreneurs and, there's different levels. There's a free group. There's a paid group and I've built masterminds and I've got coaching clients around the world and I've built a small team that supports me and you know, I'm doing what I truly, truly love doing. And, and it took me a long time to get here, but I can tell you, I'm way happier than when I was working corporate. Even when I have all the money, I, I, I was I always felt like I was handcuffed to that desk. Exactly. There is nothing more beautiful than, than to do what we love. Now, when you said freedom, at one moment, uh, you said we, we all, like, I know I also struggled. I, I knew I have abundance blocks. 
uh, I honestly went to hypnotherapy to, to try to remove the abundance blocks mm -hmm. because of the previous experiences. And at one moment, one of the coaches said, you are the voice of freedom because I survived everything that I did. And I, I understand, well, yeah, I am. That's a kind of cool, right? And it's, it's beautiful when you can provide that to people like you are doing now. And I, I thank you for that. Now we're going to have uh, some fun a little bit. I will ask you uh, quick questions and you will hear ring bell when the time is up. <laughs> you have one <laughs> second to answer to Short me. Answer. <laughs> one word. First thing you think of. Okay, I got this. I clear First, my mind. Okay. Concentrate. What's your favorite book? Oh gosh. Well, the book that changed my life was actually mine, obviously. I think the book, I think the book that everybody should read, even in high school, I wish I would have read it when I was that age, was How to Win Friends and Influence Other People by Dale Carnegie. I think that book is full of common sense and wisdom on how to be influential and speak and and also build really strong networks and relationships. And we read it and go, yeah, this makes sense. But then you realize that the world is not doing that. I mean, the world is interrupting each other and, and creating division and all these negative things. And people are really struggling because they don't know how to communicate their words properly. And they're not understanding how to be heard or how to build the right networks and truly success. I hate to say, say this because nobody likes to admit it, but success is really about not only who you know, but who knows you, mm. you know, if they don't know who you are, then the opportunities are limited compared to someone who's well known has figured something out or understands how to win friends and influence other people. Mm. So that same set of skills could be manipulative in the wrong hands, but in the right hands with the right intentions, it's beautiful. And very few people have that knowledge and actually have seen it in a book. You're like, Oh my gosh, I wish I would have known this for decades. I read that book three times. That was the, one of the first books that I read in, in, in a field of personal growth. But I will be honest, I haven't understand much back then. And so, so I needed to repeat a few times more. Definitely one of my favorites. If you have any and accept cars, what do you like to do in your spare time? I like to work out. I like to lift heavy weights. Uh, I'm 48 and I'm physically stronger than I've ever been in my life. And I used to be an athlete my whole life since high school and really kind of fell off the fitness wagon in my mid 30s. And at 40, I started looking in the mirror and I didn't like what I saw anymore. So I had to get back into being who I should be. But now, yeah, I'm much stronger, much stronger than I was ever. I would never say you are 48. Never. I'm 48. Like, you look 10 years younger. Just <laughs> Well, thank you. Saying. <laughs> thank you. Must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what would be your advice for someone who, who wished to scale their business, for example? To scale their business. I think that... First of all, hire a coach or join mm. an accountability group of people who have done it before you, mm. or the mastermind group that have, of people who have done it before you, because you need the accountability and you need to understand that there are people out there willing to support you and guide you. Mm. It's not going to be your friends and family. The people that you surround yourself with in high school and your, your longtime colleagues and friends, they're not going to give you the advice that you need because people give the advice from the context of their own understanding of their own experiences. So they're not going to be able to give you solid advice. Mm -hmm. Probably going to give you bad advice and you're going to trust them because you love them and you enjoy those people, but they're not going to help you. And so yeah, surround yourself with people who have done the things and pay the money. People hire coaches, not for the knowledge. The number one reason they hire coaches like me is for mistake avoidance exactly. because mistakes cost you years and thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, Tell us a little bit where people can find you, how they can reach out to you and what we can expect from your magic uh, until the end of the year. Well, thank you for that opportunity. My website is 365driven.com. So 365driven.com. And from there, you'll find my podcast, which is 365driven. And you'll find my book and all the other social media channels. I'll just try to keep it on one place, make it easy for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being my guest. I truly enjoyed it and I hope you did too. Well, thank you for having me. And I love your story as well. And it's uh, it's cool that we have so many things in common and you meet these people on the internet, right? Yeah, very cool. Thank you and see you. Bye.